Amen. You can be seated and look at in your Bible to Luke chapter 12 as much as we want to avoid the subject and maybe even complain that the church and the preacher only talk about money, a major obstacle in our growth as a Christian can be our money. Jesus already noted this truth back in the first parable that we studied in this series. It was the parable of the souls. And the third soul, it said that the seed fell among the thorns and that the thorns choked out that seed. And the thorns were described as worries, cares, and riches. So you see, uh, Jesus, if he's going to teach about life, Sooner or later, he's going to have to teach about finances, about money, because we can't make it through a day without money. I was woke up this morning. I haven't even told Diane this. She'll be happy to know this. Four in the morning, I receive a text. I wait until my normal time to get up. Of course, I did not sleep anymore. I look at the text, and I've received an alert that my bank account, once again, has been compromised. My bank card has once again been compromised. I mean, I can't even sleep at night without money bothering me. I mean, do you have, you know what I'm talking about? So this parable might convict us, but it should not make us blame the church or get mad at the preacher, okay? Because Jesus is simply addressing a fundamental issue of discipleship. Money is a part of our life, and so Jesus is going to address that thing that is a part of our life. He deals with possessions and the relationships to our spiritual life. And this is as real today as it was in Jesus' day. In fact, I think it's probably a bigger issue in the United States because of our wealth than it was in Jesus' day. The United States is so wealthy that we have what we call first world issues. Have you heard that expression used before? First world issues. You see, third world countries, they have issues. Their issues are, are they going to have food to eat this week? Or are they going to have food to eat today? We've got first world issues. Our first world issues are, what's the flavor of the week at Cookie Crumble? That's our big issues. In fact, the United States spends more money on dog food than many countries do feeding their family. That's a first world issue. So before we get into the parable, I want to look at the context because every parable comes to us in some setting. It's not that Jesus just tells the parable. He usually tells it within a a context of a situation. So let's look at Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 13. It's going to give us the context. I'm going to actually spend a pretty good bit of time building that context before we get to the actual parable. So Luke chapter 12, verse 13 says this. Someone from the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you. He then told them, so now he turns to the whole crowd, them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Now let me make three observations about the context here. First, Jesus' primary concern is not financial arbitration. That, that's what he says. My, fina- my primary concern, Jesus says, is not to decide who gets what amount of money as far as a inheritance is concerned. That word arbitrate actually means to divide. And so the man came to Jesus and he asked him a question. I want your help in being sure I get my fair share of the inheritance. Actually, he's really not even asking Jesus to arbitrate. What he's asking Jesus to do is make a decision in his favor in absence of the brother. Without hearing the brother's side of the story, I want you to make a ruling in my favor. It was a greedy request on the part of the man. I have seen it more than once. Families fighting over what their parents left behind when they die. Often, just an observation, often it is the in-laws that are driving it. The brothers and sisters can get along with each other, 
but their spouses start pushing it. Stand up for your rights. You know this is yours. Don't let your brother push you around. He's pushed you around all your life. And Jesus said, I'm not interested in that kind of discussion. Jesus said, and he takes this, this a conversation that is meant to be about money, and he says, I am more interested in if you are rich with God. So look at this passage here, and I want to show you a powerful truth from the passage. Each parable, we're gaining a powerful truth. The powerful truth on the, tr on the screen is this. Jesus is less interested in one's material inheritance, and he's more interested in one's spiritual inheritance. So he is more interested in what you're going to leave behind spiritually, the legacy you're going to leave behind spiritually, than he is the financial legacy that you'll leave behind. The second observation about the context found in verse 15, we should watch out against greed. So he uses the term watch out, which means to stare at, to discern clearly, and then he uses the word guard. He says guard against greed. And the word guard means to preserve or to obey or to avoid something. We're told to guard against all greed. And the word guard is a constant vigilance against this. And Jesus now in verse 15, he's not just talking to the man. He turns to them. He's talking to the whole crowd that he's teaching to. And he says guard yourselves against greed. And the word greed means to covet. It means to extort. It it means to love money and to hoard it up. Actually, the word is used in a list of the fleshly deeds in Ephesians 5. That same list that has all those, those sexual sins has this, this listed, this greed, as a fleshly sin as well. Why should we be on guard against greed? Well, that leads me to the third thing about this uh, context. Because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. When my life is all said and done, it's not going to be evaluated on how much I have or how little I have. It's going to be evaluated on whether or not I'm rich spiritually, whether or not I'm rich in my relationship with God. That word abundance means to, to be in excess, to, uh, to be superfluous. It's to cause or to think one is, is in excessive amount. Now, don't miss this. The parable isn't talking so much about money as it is about our attitude and approach to money. So with that in mind, let's read the actual parable now, starting with verse 16. So Jesus has given us the context. Now verse 16 is the parable. Then he told them a parable. So this is answering the man who says, make a judgment for me, arbitrate for me. It's also addressing the issue of greed. So he says in the parable, verse 16, a rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich with God. Now, there are six things, I think, mistakes that the rich man makes. I think we can make the same six. Number one, we mistakenly think our good fortune is solely our doing. So we think that it's our job that we've worked and we got the education for and we worked the long hours. It's all about us. That's the first mistake we make. So notice the man has a great crop one year. Now he, he doesn't gain it in a dishonest way. I mean, he's farming, he's working, he, it's, it's an honest living. But you know how farming is, especially in that day. It is even to this day in a certain extent it's this way. You can do everything right. You can work hard. And sometimes you hit it with the crop and sometimes you don't. This year he hit it. It was a bumper crop. It was a great crop. It, it, it was so much that he says, I've got so much I'll never have to work uh, again a day in my life. Now we have good fortune come our way. Sometimes that good fortune is our job. It's our skills. 
It's our niche that we're able, because of that niche, to have a good job. It's our education. It's our work ethic. It's our intelligence. I would tell my oldest daughter, Faith, I would tell her growing up, I said, God has given you a gift. You need to understand that's from God. She could read something or hear something one time, and she had it. That's why she's got a DR in front of her name. She can read it and hear it, and she knows it just like that. And I would tell her, not everybody can do that. I said, your mom and dad, we don't have that gift. Your sister doesn't have that gift. We've got other gifts, but we don't have that gift. It was a gift from God, and whatever you have, However you work, whatever job you have, whatever ability you have to, to make an income, it's a gift from God. In fact, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So the first mistake we think is we think that our gain is something that we solely did ourselves. Second mistake. We mistakenly think we can do with income whatever we desire. Notice I didn't say we could do with our income because our ain't in it, okay? We can do with income whatever we desire. That's a mistake. So the man, notice in verse 17, so he has this great uh, uh, production from his crop in verse 16. In verse 17, the first thing he does, it says he thought to himself. He didn't pray. He didn't look around. He didn't see if anybody else had needs. He thought to himself. The mistake was he thought it was his income and he could do whatever he wanted to with it. He approached his unexpected higher income with a self-centered mindset and therefore a destructive mindset. That's true not only in finances, that's true in life. Self selfishness will end up leading to self-destruction. He uses his resources in a way that displeases God. And the parable calls for self-examination. Don't worry, this is not a long sermon, but it's going to be a hard sermon. There's a lot of self-examination in this sermon. How do you feel about what God has given you? Do you feel like it is from God, or do you feel like it's something you've done? Both the wise use of resources and the absence of greed is what is addressed in this parable. Our wealth opens choices for us to allow pursuit away from God. The more wealth we have, I know some people say, well, if I just made as much as you, I'd tithe. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. The more money you make, the more options you have, which means the odds are you're going to do something other than honor God with it because the odds have increased. I uh, upset a few people several years ago, uh, and I'm probably, not intentionally, might upset some again, but it's not my heart's intent. I made the comment that if you can go to Disney World, you ought to be able to tithe, and that upsets some people. Now, I'm not, I appreciate that one, amen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not against Disney World. I mean, I've got my own personal opinion, but it's not like I'm going to fault anybody for it. My point was that I never got a chance to make to the person because they came secondhand to me. The point was I know how much it costs because we priced it once and said, I ain't doing that. I ain't wasting my money on that. So I know how much it cost. And I could have said the same thing about travel ball. Or I could have said the same thing about uh, membership in a golf club. I mean, I, I, I could have said a lot of, I could have used a lot of examples that if we have money to do that, what we're doing is we're choosing to do something that we want to do, and we ought to be able to choose to tithe them or stop doing the other activity, one or the other. That got me in trouble a few years ago. I know y'all love me more now, and it won't get me in near as much trouble. <laughs> Some cannot imagine giving 10% of their gross family income to the church. Some just can't imagine how that can be done. And McClendon is financially strong, so you can, you can be assured this sermon is just part of the parables I'm preaching on. It's not like we're in any financial problem or anything like that. But just in the raw data, I don't look at names, just raw data, we still have a large percent of people who give nearly nothing all year. Nearly nothing all year. 
So I want to make three suggestions to all of us, to me, all of us, three suggestions. The first suggestion is this week, preferably today, if you are married, have a conversation with your spouse about your giving. Because I have, by testimony, I have heard there are people in this church that they have been lying to their spouse about how much they're giving because the spouse doesn't look at that side of the finances and all that. In other words, I could be giving nothing and Diane wouldn't know because she doesn't monitor that. And there's some spouses in this church by testimony that have come to me that they are lying to their spouse. So the first thing you need to do is talk to your spouse if you're married. If you're not married, you just got to fuss between you and God. I mean, that's the only thing you got going, okay? You need, you need to... Talk to your spouse and be honest and say, this is what we're doing. That conversation needs to happen probably today. Diane and I are going to have this conversation. It won't, it won't be a fight with us, though. Some of y'all are going to have to set up marriage counseling this next week after that. <laughs> and you ought to be mad at each other. If you lie about that, what else would you, not lie, would you lie about? So you ought to get upset about it. So first, talk to your spouse. Number two, start, now I'm talking about people who feel like a tithe is just out of their realm. They can't do it. Start with an amount and give it on the first day of every month. You, you decide on the amount. It may, it may be a small 1%, 2%. It may be $50 a month. It may be $100 a month. It, it doesn't matter the amount. You start with, with an amount and you consistently give that. Not August 15th, not August 30th, August 1st. You start and you do that every month consistently. Number three Start praying and submitting to God in the area of finances. I mean, it's just something we got to deal with. Number three, we mistakenly think hoarding income leads to financial security. So that's what happens in verse 18. At first, it looks like the man is prudent. He had a great crop, and so he's going to save up some of that for a rainy day. And that's not a bad thing. That's a great financial principle, actually, to have a little money stored back in case the refrigerator goes out or the washer and dryer goes out or something like that. That's a good financial principle. But this man's error is that he, his view of the income, notice how many times he uses the word I. Look at verses 17 through 19. You could just underline them each time. There are five times he uses the word I, and four times he uses the word my. It's, it's, it's a my goods, my crop, my barns. He even talks about my soul. You know, it's all about what he has, what he's going to do. The essence of greed is keeping what resources God brings our way for ourselves. Do I take the things that God has given me and do I use them in a way that honors him or dishonors him? God is the most generous being there is. I mean, God has given us the earth to live on. He's given us the universe to enjoy. Most of all, he's given us Jesus Christ as the means of redemption. So generosity is in the DNA of a Christian, but instead we have put it on the back burner because of personal desires. The challenges Jesus raises in the parable are timeless. Uh, am I living? Am, am I living in such a way that I have? I think I have enough money in my four hundred one k that I don't need God today. Are you living in such a way that you think you got enough money in the bank right now that you don't need God today? Could it be that there's a real reason why Jesus gave us? We call it the Lord's Prayer. The better, better term is the model prayer. In the model prayer, Jesus said that we should ask, give us this day our daily bread. Could it be a reason that he didn't say weekly bread, monthly bread, annual bread? Could it be that he really wants us to depend on him daily? By the way, it doesn't matter how much money is in the bank or in the 401k. You need God today. You just might not know it but you need God today. Number four, we mistakenly think ease and enjoyment are the goal. So this is what happens. He has this bumper crop and, and he decides, well, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to withdraw from life. He's going to eat, drink, and be merry. He feels no concern or responsibility for anyone else. 
And greed is an attitude that piles stuff on ourselves. And this parable isn't criticizing making a living. That's not what it's about. But we do need to ask some, some serious questions. I'm going to ask a couple of hard ones, and then I'll move on, I promise, okay? First, am I providing for my family? Now, follow up with that. Is that provision increasing selfishness and entitlement or is it increasing humility in my family? Now, that is a, nobody likes that question. I don't like that question. Am I providing for my family? Yes. Is the way I'm providing for my family, is it increasing selfishness and entitlement or is it increasing humility within my family? Another question. Do my children feel entitled to uh, college or whatever else with it, without it costing them anything? And, uh, am I saving up for retirement? And when I retire, am I going to retire from God? The fundamental test for the use of resources is whether or not I'm going to use it for self or whether I'm going to use it for God, which normally turns out serving other people. I mean, it's not like God's broke. You can't give your money to God. You end up serving other people with your money, and that's how you serve God. Number five, we mistakenly think we possess money forever. So in verse 20, while the man plans for a long life of ease, he's never going to have any more problems. He's just going to enjoy life. What he doesn't know is his life is getting ready to end. Jesus, in the parable, speaking for God, asked, now who will get all this stuff that you prepared for? Now that you put everything in the barns, and now, now who's going to get all this? And the answer, of course, is the man who thought he had a future really did not have the future he thought he had. Oh, he had a future, but it wasn't on earth, and it didn't involve crops, and there were no barns involved, and there was no savings account involved, he had a future, but it wasn't what he thought. That day, his life was required of him. This is the ultimate parable on you can't take it with you. It's subtle, but we tend to hoard our possessions, convincing ourselves, at least this is fed by the culture, that somehow or another we can take it with us. Now, we know, if you ask us, we know you can't take it with us. But the way we act we tend to think we can take it with us. The old cultural saying in Jesus' day was eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Uh, I think, now y'all are the young congregation, the first service they remembered. There used to be an old commercial. I can't remember exactly. It went something like this. You only go around once in life, grab all the ice cream you can. Isn't that how it went? Okay, the four people who remember that commercial knows that's not how it went. Okay, yeah. But that whole attitude that the world feeds us is an attitude that doesn't include God in the equation. It's about me and what I can do and what I want to do, and it doesn't allow that God is the one who has my days numbered. And so it says in verse 20, that very night, the man's life was required of him. Number six, we make an eternal mistake when we're not rich towards God. So richness towards God means first responding to God by accepting him in our lives, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then when, when God uh, gives us, we understand what God gives us and we honor him with what he gives us. In Ephesians 4, 28, it encourages us to work and it encourages us to work so we can earn an income so that we can share with others. Now that is not socialism. Some people have, have taken that verse and have said that the Bible teaches socialism. No, what the Bible is teaching is that I need to work and earn an income so that when God impresses upon me that there are ministries and that there's missions and there's people that I'm able to help them. Socialism is I don't have a choice. It's already taxed out of my income. And so the Bible doesn't teach that I should help people who don't want to work or don't like to work or, or, or just choosing not to work. What the Bible teaches is I ought to earn an income so I can honor God with that income. And Jesus' final commentary in verse 21 on the parable is that we need to be sure we're rich in our relationship with God. You know, it's, it's amazing how every one of these parables always ends up with salvation. 
Doesn't matter what the parable's about. It always ends up about salvation. And so Jesus brings this parable about money. In verse 21, he brings it to a head and he says, Okay, so you're rich in money, but are you rich in a relationship with me, Jesus asked. And so I would ask you today, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you rich with him? On the screen, I have a question for us to think about. Do you need to repent of the sin of thinking you can do whatever you want with your income? Just look at that for a minute. Just ask God to use that statement. Another question, it's not on the screen. Do you need to kneel at the altar at the invitation time and ask God for spiritual wisdom on how to handle the resources he's given you? Many of us in this room, especially compared to other countries, almost everybody in this room has a lot of resources compared to most countries. Are we actually spiritually seeking God? God, what do you want me to do with these resources? And a third question, have you accepted the rich gift of salvation? Paid for by Jesus Christ. As Jimmy makes his way, you keep listening to me. Salvation is not free. It just doesn't cost you anything. Salvation is super expensive. It costs the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, coming to the earth, living a sinless life, dying on the cross, a cruel, suffering death for you and being raised from the dead. It's super expensive. But today, he offers it to you free of charge. All it costs you is faith, just accepting, just surrender. Would you accept that free gift today? God, I pray that you would convict us. I mean, you have pretty well beat us up in this message. And Lord, I pray that that conviction would also be coupled with a, a response on our part, a time of repentance a time of confession, a time of serious conversation with family members. And God, for the person in this room, the man, the woman, the single person, the married person, the senior adult, the teenager, that has never confessed Christ as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they would see they could do that today that God extends that offer to their heart right now. And without hesitation, Lord, that they would come from the balcony or from the back or from the front and come and tell Brother Alex or myself that they're ready to give their life to Christ as Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.